Hello ladies and gentlemen of YouTube, this is Magnius, and welcome back to another episode of Minecraft Dinosaurs. This is our little baby Allosaurus, and actually I just noticed in the text, our Plesiosaur doesn't have enough space to grow, which is very strange because I'm pretty sure that Nessie has been fully grown for quite a while if you look down there. I don't, I don't see how Nessie could possibly need more space, how can Nessie get any bigger? Nessie is one of our oldest dinosaurs, I don't believe that Nessie is still growing. But nonetheless, we are back, we are back with Minecraft Dinosaurs, and we have some research concerning colored feathers for dinosaurs and dinosaurs with their colored vision and stuff like that. Unfortunately, today we don't have a lot of time to record, and so I'm going to be recording for maybe 15 minutes. Many apologies for that, but I figured that you would prefer a 15 minute video as opposed to not having a video at all this weekend for Minecraft Dinosaurs. So. Let us get to work with creating our Allosaurus enclosure. When this gets like three blocks high, I think we're going to release our Allosaurus. Since uh, it's not going to be moving for quite a while, I think. It, it takes a long time for these guys to grow. So let's see. Uh, before I did any of this, I actually wanted to make these a little bit taller so that I can see them better. But yes, let us discuss the amazingness that is the dinosaur research. Of course, space stuff is also going on, but not a whole lot of space stuff compared to, you know, knowing about the comet landing. The comet landing was sort of like the big thing that was going on. Yeah. Okay. And compared to that, we're just, we're not going to get any more amazingly awesome stuff for a while. Uh, I think in two weeks we will have the launch of a Delta IV rocket carrying the Orion capsule on top of it, which is also very cool, but not as cool as comets. So, take that as you will. We will discuss that when it happens, and I will probably post it on Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that, because it will be totally cool, so you should follow us on Facebook and Twitter. But we're not going to be talking about that today. Today we're going to be talking about Dim dinosaurs. And if we do have some extra time, I think I will also discuss... What will I discuss? I will discuss perhaps racism in Korea. I noticed a lot of videos on YouTube today and earlier today, the last couple of days, discussing racism in Korea, which is always something that I'm very interested in discussing because, as you guys know, I live in Korea and racism in Korea directly affects me. Uh, do we have any more stairs? We do not have any more stairs. Alright, so clearly I need to go make some more stairs and stuff. Do I have any more? I do have, I have plenty of bricks. Good, 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 good. Uh, don't need any of this though. Alright, that should be good. Let's, uh, let's just do this. There we go. Okay, so yes, the research for dinosaurs, first of all, as you guys know, dinosaurs are the direct ancestors of birds, and birds are very, very colorful. They're like amazingly colorful. Compared to other things in the animal kingdom, they're crazy, crazy colorful. It, uh, it's mind-boggling how colorful they are. They, uh, in fact, birds are one of the few things that I know of on the earth whose color goes not only into the visible spectrum, but also into the ultraviolet spectrum. Now, there are some humans, people who are lacking a lens due to either some sort of disease or something like that, if they're missing a lens in their eye, then those people can see ultraviolet light. However, birds see ultraviolet light normally. Now, ultraviolet light, as you may know from the fact that it's ultraviolet, is light that is beyond violet in the color spectrum, in the electromagnetic spectrum. It, when viewed by humans that have the ability to see it, which again is quite rare, you need to not have a lens since the lens blocks most ultraviolet light, uh, people claim that it's sort of a bluish-whitish color, which makes sense because, you know, blue and white are, well, not white, but blue-purple colors are near the, uh, colors that we can actually see normally, assuming that we have moderately working color vision. However, birds, on the other hand, can see ultraviolet light. They can see it normally, they don't need to have any sort of disease or anything wrong with them in order to see this. I don't think that birds' feathers naturally come in ultraviolet colors, though. 
which I'm not really sure why that is. I read that. I'm not sure if that's perfectly correct or not, but let's let's go with that for now. I'll put that there. I don't know if that should be there, but meh. Oh no. Okay, there we go. Nice. Okay, so... Ta-da! I think that's all of our corners now. I think with all of our corners done, we should be quite okay here. But yeah, so, birds can see ultraviolet light, and in fact, birds have some of the most advanced colored vision of any animals on Earth. And the reason for this, and the reason that mammals, humans included, generally have very poor color vision, and the fact that... Uh, some mammals even don't have color vision at all. Some mammals are completely colorblind. I believe maybe dogs are pretty colorblind. And other various mammal species as well. The reasons for this... Let's see, how tall do I want to make this? Maybe 10? Maybe? This is 2, right? 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8... 9? That's that's pretty tall. Yeah, I think I think that's more than tall enough. Let's go for nine. But yeah, the reason that mammals have not developed extremely amazing color vision and our color vision is generally not as good as birds is because mammals during the time when the dinosaurs were like, yo, we're living during the day and we are evolving all, all of these amazing... Why did I do this? I didn't even count how many this is. Um, crap. <laughs> One, two... Three, four, five, six. So I need three more. All right. One, two, three. I think that's good. Maybe? Okay, we're good. So, the mammals, on the other hand, were nocturnal, and in some terms, in some points in time, subterranean. So they didn't really need color vision. Humans, the only reason that humans and primates eh, primates developed colored vision is because 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, is because we ate fruit back in the old days, and in order to know when fruit was ripe and which fruits you should and shouldn't eat, color vision was very important. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, maybe, yeah. This looks fine, right? I think this will be tall enough. I really don't think that Allosaurus is going to be able to jump over nine freaking blocks of iron bars. Yeah. We good. Okay. So. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so... While the mammals were busy being subterranean, I cannot count and do this at the same time. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. While mammals were busy being subterranean and living underground and not really worrying about colors and stuff, I need food. The dinosaurs were developing feathers. Now, one of the primary reasons that dinosaurs developed straight, flat feathers, which would eventually end up being flight feathers, uh, as you know, Archaeopteryx had flat flight feathers. Flat flight feathers, that's so hard to say. Um, flat feathers actually developed before dinosaurs were ever able to fly. And the question has always been, why? Why did they have flight feathers before they could fly? Where, like, their bones weren't exactly adept. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Why? Why in the world did these things have these unnecessary feathers? Which eventually ended up providing them with flight. But... The larger ones as well had flight feathers, even though they couldn't fly. And one of the reasons appears to be... 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9... One of the reasons appears to be that they were used for coloration. Now, the kinds of feathers that dinosaurs had before flight feathers, they were called like proto-feathers. Those proto-feathers, they were more like fur. They were... If you uh, know what kiwis are like, if you've ever touched a kiwi, those aren't flight feathers, those are like proto-feathers, or like the plumage of a uh, an ostrich or an emu. That Those are not flight feathers, it's like a furry kind of feather. Those are not very good at holding color, and if you ever look at... 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8... 8, 9... And it's getting dark, we should probably go to sleep. 
If you ever look at those kinds of birds, you'll see that they're not very colorful, actually. Kiwis are not very colorful birds. Ostriches and emus are also not very colorful. Black, brown, and some yellowish tinges. That's, that's really about it. That's all the color that you can have for those proto feathers because proto feathers are very bad at having structural color as the article that you can click in the video description below says. So those not very good for holding color. The flat flight feathers that we know of today developed apparently as a result of the need to express themselves colorfully to each other the same way that birds do today. So dinosaurs developed those which in turn ended up resulting in flight for the smaller species which were light enough that they could glide and eventually develop flight. However, I feel I feel as if I'm starving constantly. Is that it? Yes, that is enough food. Wonderful. So, the primary cause maybe of evolution of flight in dinosaurs was originally the fact that they lived during the day which meant that colors and seeing in colors oh my gosh you freaking useless triceratops why do you always do this seeing in colors was very important and so seeing in color provided them with the need the, the evolutionary need to evolve various different kinds of colors to express themselves from mating rituals and things like that and after all of that was taken care of those same feathers which were good for holding color also ended up providing some species with the ability to fly. So it was all just a happy coincidence, as evolution usually is. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Wonderful. And I think that is all of our pillars, maybe. So, at this point, I think I need to just put down the iron bars and we will do the roof at some other point in the future. But yes, so apparently that is the research that has been done somewhat recently using various other kinds of shenanigans technology that I don't really understand. You guys can read about it in the article linked below because, meh, I am not a paleontologist and I enjoy reading about new dinosaur research casually. Uh, I don't actually go into the hard science and the fossil studies and stuff like that. I just I just relay the information to you and I just read it and be like, oh, so that's why that works the way it is. I uh, don't actually work in the field. If I did, though, considering the fact that I'm socially awkward like that, I would probably tell you for hours how it works, even if you weren't interested at all. Uh... This is going to be such a pain to build eventually. This is going to cause so many problems. I don't know, maybe maybe I should just build up like one of these one of these very narrow ones first. Maybe maybe that would be good. Just so I can see how it'll look. I can't actually see... I can't see anything because Minecraft is so pixelated. I'm like, am I actually placing these on the right spot? I can't... I have no depth perception. What is this? Yeah, okay, I think... I think this is good. Maybe. Okay. Is there anything else about that research that I should tell you guys? I, uh... Can't really think of any. Just knowing that one of the characteristics that may have led to the flight in dinosaurs was the fact that they were awake during the day, whereas mammals were nocturnal and subterranean, which allowed them to have longer periods of time where their their eyesight could evolve to work during the daytime, be very awesome, catch UV light as well as visible spectrum light. Which, I guess, to birds, the UV actually is the visible spectrum. They would say that we're useless and have bad eyes, I suppose. Um, at this point, I cannot go further without going and checking on... Yeah, going and checking on our stuff down there. Because I don't know if we need to do the top one as stone, or if we go all the way to the top with iron bars. I can't remember, so we're going to go check that out. We're going to go and say hello to Amber and to what is what is the boy's name i cannot remember either way we're gonna go say hello 
and we are going to see how the roof is done. That actually, that roof looks pretty terrible on the mammoth place. Maybe we should change that. Now, since we talked about the dinosaur research as awesome as it is, I also wanted to discuss racism in Korea, which is something that I sort of touched on before a couple of times. Uh, rendering bugs, rendering bugs. As you guys know, I live in Korea, and I am also not a Korean by way of blood. I'm on the process, in the process, of becoming a Korean via paper, legally becoming a citizen. But uh, that takes us some time, so we're not exactly done with that yet. Uh, does this look okay? I guess the top one is just slabs then, huh? Yeah, it's just slabs, and I guess I should use some stairs as well to make it look a little bit better. I think the uh, the top could be a little bit prettier over here as well. Also, what is the name of our other Pachycephalosaurus? I can't remember. Ah, Aristotle. Aristotle, of course. And little Violet over here. Violet, I'm so sorry that you're so lonely. No one, no one cares about you at all, Violet. It makes me so sad. I feel like Minecraft is very quiet today. Has it played any music so far? I'm pretty sure it hasn't. But meh. So, racism in Korea. As you guys know, Korea is mostly Koreans. Um, somewhere over 99%. Compared to the United States, which I believe last time I checked is 70% Caucasian. I think the US is something, something around there. Although... Caucasians are a majority in the U.S. They're actually not as big of a majority as you may think. They're they're nowhere near like 99%, for example. So the U.S., even if they don't really like it, some people, um, it's quite multicultural. Uh, of course, the U.S. still has many problems with racism, as you've probably seen in television recently with certain cops and certain young men in Ferguson, for example. <laughs> you know, excluding that. Not going to uh, discuss such a crazy topic here today, but yeah, so there is racism in the U.S., but it's not really something that you deal with on a daily basis unless you are a minority and you live in a very racist area. For example, if you live in Mississippi or somewhere in the South where there are lots of, how shall we say, lesser educated people who are part of the majority, then you will probably deal with racism then. But if you live in a large city, uh, a place near a university, a place that's generally liberal, then you probably don't have to worry about racism so much. Korea, not really that diverse, so racism is still something that's sort of a problem. I've noticed recently a lot of videos on YouTube of expats who live in Korea, expatriates like myself, although I guess technically once I become Korean, I won't be an expatriate anymore. Uh, people who use YouTube as a way to rant about the injustices that they feel that they have encountered in Korea. Which is totally cool with me. I know what it feels like to be discriminated against as a Caucasian living in, in Korea. And I, I agree with them. I think that, you know, discussing that is very important and bringing it to light that it's not acceptable to be racist is very important, of course. However, I feel... I don't know. There, there's lots of different kinds of racism here in, in Korea, which sounds sort of strange to say that there are different kinds of racism, but there's well-intentioned racism, and then there's, like, bad-intentioned racism. Uh, if you live in Korea, you probably already understand what I'm talking about, but for those of you who don't, the well-intentioned racism is racism that Koreans will tell you up and down is not racism. They will tell you that it's meant to be kind to you. For example, if you're in a restaurant and you're Caucasian, Koreans will assume that you cannot use chopsticks and they will offer you a spoon. Not all restaurants, not all Koreans, of course. You know, this is just speaking generally. Sometimes this happens. They'll offer you a spoon or a fork because they assume that you cannot use chopsticks. To a Korean person who does this, they think that they're doing something kind to you. They're offering you help. To an average Westerner, or basically anyone that I know, it's uh, rather insulting because it's essentially saying, I'm assuming based on the color of your skin, that you are unable to use chopsticks. Which is insane to me because chopsticks are super easy to use and the only people I've ever met who can't use chopsticks are young children and people who have never eaten Chinese food in their lives. 
So, I, uh, I don't really get it. I don't understand, personally, but that's just me. So, that's well-intentioned racism. Another well-intentioned racism is uh, Koreans assuming that people do not speak Korean and then speak English to them instead. Again, they think that they're doing you a favor, but actually it's pretty insulting because it's underestimating our abilities as individuals. So, we would prefer, many people would prefer personally, I'm one of these people, that, you know, this is Korea, so everyone just speak in Korean, and if someone goes, what? Then you can speak in another language, right? Then you can speak in English or German or Spanish or whatever they may be able to speak. And we are out of iron bars now. Hmm. I wonder if we have more. We may not have more iron bars. So, oh, and apparently we're already over 20 minutes. This is sad. Okay, so... I'm going to finish this discussion of racism in Korea very quickly because I have to go, like, right now. However, I wanted to finish the discussion, so... Th there's that, and then there's the not well-intentioned racism, which is, of course, you know, telling foreigners that they don't belong in Korea, that they should go home, telling black people that they're somehow worth less than other people just, you know, because of the color of their skin. This is the, the bad racism that even Korean people will admit is racism. So... Both of these kinds of racism exist in Korea, and there's there's also something else that I like to consider like culturalism. For example, a lot of older Korean people will be quote-unquote racist towards... Wow, I don't think we have any iron, actually. Be quote-unquote racist towards Korean people. They are Korean, but they're speaking in English, and the reason that that happens is because they assume that they're speaking English as a way to show off. They want to show off that they're well-educated or something like that. Uh, yeah, that's that's a completely thing, different thing altogether, and I don't even know how to really, like, discuss that, like, culturalism as opposed to racism, because indeed they are Korean people who are being treated badly. But I just wanted to say that, for you guys, this is my English time. Doing YouTube, this is when I speak English. YouTube is literally my English time. I, wow, so many biofossils. I do not speak English outside of my home, except when I'm meeting someone who doesn't speak English or someone who's incredibly close to me, or someone who doesn't speak Korean, I mean. Outside, out there, that's Korea. Inside in my apartment, this is, you know, my home, and YouTube, clearly, like, I use, oh, wow, Quagga. Hello, Quagga DNA. Did I get that before? I have no memory of this whatsoever. That's awesome. So we may have just gotten Quagga DNA. Huzzah! Um, that's cool. That's really cool. Alright, so I guess we can end on that with the Quagga DNA. That's a pretty decent spot to, to end it on. But yeah, so... Uh, personally, in my personal opinion, this isn't everyone's opinion, of course, but I personally feel that... If you live in Korea, that you should speak Korean when you go outside. I know that technically, like, you shouldn't be obligated to speak a certain language when you're anywhere. You know, it is technically my right to speak English no matter where I am. Of course, that's true. But it bothers people, and this is Korea. And people can feel uncomfortable with hearing a foreign language outside. And mostly older people, but some younger people as well. What is that sound? And as a result of that, I feel that generally... You know, speaking Korean in Korea is the right idea. Just like I feel that although I respect, like, people who speak Spanish in the U.S., I feel that everyone who lives in the U.S. should be capable of speaking English because, you know, not to do so is pretty rude to everyone else who doesn't speak your language. And so, I feel that anyone who may be discriminated against, not for the color of their skin, but for the language that they speak, I'm gonna go with, maybe you should speak Korean more often. That's, that's my thing. And I, uh, I'm sure that I will talk about this more in the future because it is a topic that I care very deeply about. However, today we have no more time and I'm already over time by four minutes. So for now, thank you so much everyone for watching. My name is Megnius and I will see you next time.